news that impacts you and your community. 13 on your side news starts now. Hello everyone, I'm Juliette Dragas. And I'm Matt Garr. Welcome to this special presentation of 13 on your side news and one good thing. Juliette, I am constantly looking for stories here in West Michigan that touch the heart and have a call to action. And that is what one good thing is all about. And over the next half hour, we're going to share with you some of our favorite stories from the last year. And we begin with a community effort to find a Honda shadow for a man in Nuego County. And for Noah Davy, that motorcycle was much more than a bike. Me and Shane always rode motorcycles together, worked on bikes. Their bond over motorcycles is just one of the things that Noah Davy loves the most about his older brother Shane. A musical genius, you know, great guy, free spirit. Everybody that ever met him just loved him to death. And Shane loved this bike but he eventually had to part ways with the 750cc engine and the chrome pipes. He actually moved into a house and in order to get money towards the down payment for that house, he had to sell his, his bike, which you know he wasn't too happy about, but he made a responsible decision. Then Shane's life took a hard turn. He's been battling with mental health issues for for a little while now and unfortunately he lost his battle. I wouldn't wish this situation upon anybody losing my brother, my best friend. No one needed a way to feel his brother's presence again. He was determined to buy back that motorcycle, but the roads to that goal came with dead ends. I called police stations. I called secretary of state and everybody told me the same thing. You know, you weren't part of the sale, so unfortunately we can't help you. A desperate email was his last hope. I reached out to uh, the Grand Rapids local radio show, Free Beer and Hot Wings, and just kind of on a last ditch effort and a whim, I really didn't think anything would come of it, but they ended up um, reading my email on air. Guys, my name is Noah, and I am asking for your help. Help me spread the word so I can try to get into contact with the current owner in hopes to purchase the motorcycle back from him or her. Listeners were able to help me out and I got the name of the man that bought the motorcycle from my brother. I agreed to sell it back to Noah and he just walks up to my driveway and gives me a big hug unexpectedly and tears in his eyes. He tells me how much this means to him. I mean, in a time like this, I couldn't ask for more than that. Taking the bike out on the open road is like therapy for Noah. This bike, I mean, it's more than just a bike. I mean, I'll ride any bike, but this one is just, it's a piece of him. And I feel like when I'm riding it, I, I got him looking over my shoulder. And it just makes me feel a little bit closer to him. Now, Noah wanted to share that story not only as a way to make sure his brother gets remembered, but he also wants to make sure that people know it's okay to ask for help when they find themselves in a time of a mental health crisis. 988 is the number for the National Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. You can call it around the clock for free to be connected with a trained crisis counselor who can help you out. Well, adults might think of high school kids as just that, kids. But for young children, teenagers can be role models. Consider, for instance, a second grader from Rockford whose experience at a football game gave him his new hero. Smash right through that line of blue. Watch the score keep growing. Seven-year-old Fisher is a Rockford super fan. Rockford Rams are bound to win. <gasps> They're fighting with the fam. Ra ra ra! See their team is weakening. Victory is now in view. He's only missed three football games since 2021, and as you can tell, he knows every word to the fight song. Fight, fight, Rockford fight, victory for RHS. So when Rockford dominated Caledonia on September 15th in one of the most highly anticipated games of the year, Fisher knew he had to get out on that track and celebrate with the Rams. I ran out to sing the fight song. And then I met this guy, Johnny. Johnny is Rockford Junior running back Jonathan Heiser. I saw this little kid on the sideline and I was like, oh my goodness, he looks like he, he looks like a chill kid. And he was really nice and he took a picture. That picture meant so much to Fisher that his aunt posted it on social media to thank Johnny. The next week, um, a lot of players noticed that. They came up to me in the locker room and they just like hyped me up about it. They were like, 
we're going to encourage you to take a further step. Coach Cummings handed me a football, and I had an extra pair of cleats in my locker that I did not use. And I'm like, it's home game, so I just not go all out. So I signed my name on the ball in the cleats and handed it to him. So he was very happy about that. Happy might be an understatement. Fisher called that the best day of his life. He fell asleep that night holding the ball that he received from his new hero. This kid is seeing us, the whole team, as basically an NFL team. And it's like, that's awesome. And I just hope that one day he'll get to this point too and he could show that kindness to somebody else. Johnny and the Rams gave Fisher quite a few memories this year. Rockford finished their season with 11 wins and just one loss. They won both the conference championship and the district championship. Way to go, Rams. Well, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Rosa Parks, John Lewis. These are all civil rights icons we've heard of because they stood up for what was right. But chances are you have not heard the name John Stubbs until right now. And that's because his inspiring story of civil disobedience was sealed in the Grand Rapids City Archives until just this year. I have a lot of memories of traveling with him. We would go to fun places, always go to Kentucky, to Louisville, where he's from, and attend the Derby and stay with my aunt and visit family. Megan Stubbs was just 12 years old when her dad passed away. John Stubbs was a Grand Rapids police officer in the 50s and 60s. But Megan didn't get to hear much about his law enforcement days until she was introduced to the current chief of police. I met Chief Winstrom uh, through a friend of a friend, and I was like, hey, chief of police, let's go straight to the top and ask this guy if he knows about my dad. Are there archives that I could maybe look at and see him as a police officer back in the day? Because when he was my dad, he wasn't a police officer. I just thought it was a, would be a great opportunity to check it out, check out the archives and see if maybe there was something I, I could dig up that would be of interest to her. Officer Stubbs folder was being held in a locked part of the archives where personnel files are stored. He became a, a police officer in 1953. Uh, one of the first things we saw was a, a picture of him in his uniform. There were letters of commendation in the file and just seeing different places he lived in the city it was just like so fascinating because these are things I would never have known. But then something that really piqued my interest was I saw an envelope which was sealed and had a, a statement right on there dated 1953 and only to be opened uh, by the authority of the chief of police. I uh, recognized this uh, as something that, uh, to be honest, I was thinking, oh boy, if I open this and it's something, it, it could be something embarrassing. What was actually inside was not embarrassing for Stubbs, at least not from today's point of view. He was arrested simply for trying to play tennis in a whites only, uh, on a whites only tennis court and that he stood up for himself and he was really willing to go to court and willing to go and you know give a statement to the paper that he shouldn't have been arrested in 1948 Kentucky that's um, I mean that takes a lot of courage with this discovery Megan has had a chance to ponder what her dad might think about America today I think we're always working towards progress and we're gonna have stumblings and mistakes along the way um, but I think he would be heartened with where we are and also there to keep us to the fire and say keep improving. If you would like to dig up some history of your own, the Grand Rapids City Archives is open Monday through Friday from 8 to 5. They do ask that you make an appointment. Still to come, glory days never passed him by the local baseball legend whose career just won't seem to end. And a pontoon business turns someone else's bad deed into a way to support our nation's heroes. Welcome back. He is more than a seasoned baseball veteran. Phil Clements is a legend. We first introduced you to Phil two years ago, and unlike Bruce Springsteen's baseball anthem, Phil's glory days never passed him by, even decades into his golden years. Since his days at Belding High School and Central Michigan University, Phil Clements has been playing baseball almost his whole life. Even now, when most of his teammates over the years have called it a career. Basically, I've just, just been trying to stay on top of the grass and stay in a uh, halfway decent activity state. How old are you now? 84. 84 years young and still playing organized hardball. But staying in shape is not as easy as Phil makes it look out there on the mound. 
Well, I don't do as much as I should do, but uh, I do enough, I guess, to stay at a level. But I got to tell you, uh, deterioration is starting to set in. <laughs> Guys who have been playing with Phil for years wanted him to know how much they admire him. So this game at Sullivan Field was a tribute to a career few others will ever experience. He played against the likes of Satchel Page and he got a hit off him. This is great here. All these guys I've played against or with over the years uh, showing up some of them I haven't seen since you know playing days so it's really gratifying. Gratifying too for Phil's family and somewhat of a time machine for his old CMU teammate Al Korotkowski who got to catch Phil's ceremonial first pitch. Just reliving memories and uh, and then thinking of all the baseball legends around the world and uh, and I know one of them. It meant a lot to me because they were acknowledging him for the person that he is. And I think that's important for any of us. With all this pomp and circumstance, there are some whispers in the stands that this might be Phil's last year. So I asked him if that's true. Well, yeah, my wife says I've been saying that for 60 years. At one time I thought I was all done at 30 and then somebody came with a 30 and over league and then a 40 and over league. So much for a straightforward answer. That's classic Phil. I'm still trying to get it right. <laughs> when do you think that'll be? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I hope I got enough years left that I can do that. Here's to many more years for Phil to look back at moments like this. I'll remember this forever. Uh, since that story aired, Phil's career has continued. He took part in an 80 and older league in Canton, Ohio, along with the 75 and older Roy Hobbs World Series in Fort Myers, Florida. Nature can do wonders for your mental health, especially here in Michigan, and a local business recently embarked on a mission to ensure peace of mind for our nation's heroes. Hey, hey can I get warm, please? Before dead and reborn again. <laughs> <laughs> Navy veteran Tony Atlas and Marine veteran Wayne Brooks are enjoying a relaxing day on the Big Muskegon River. Tony, you got me close. Oh, huh? don't blame me. What do you mean? Even when it seems like they're not relaxing. Four bites and two fish. That's not good. For these two heroes, a day away from the Michigan veteran homes is just what they needed. If I had to pay a thousand dollars, I would. Wayne and Tony didn't have to pay a dime, thanks to a group called the Croton Sportsmen for Youth and Disabled Veterans. It's just been a fun time and good people, a lot of camaraderie with veterans. Ed Lewis has been taking fellow veterans fishing for 14 years and you never know what kind of crowd you're going to get. One time up on Hardy Pond, we only had two boats and we had 20 vets. They could always use more boats, which is something Tom Sullivan knows all about. And I've always been into boats and restoring boats. He and his wife started a business in 2021 called Tom's Tunes. Tearing pontoons down to the bare aluminum and putting them back together, making them look brand new. So this boat we actually bought it was stored when it, it was already refurbished and the motor got stolen off of it. Instead of getting mad, Tom decided to turn someone else's bad deed into a good one. If we're gonna put a new motor on it, we should donate it. We should give it to somebody who can use it. The Croton sportsman made all the sense in the world. My grandpa was a veteran who loved to fish and I married into a family with a bunch of veterans who love the outdoors and we see the value and what it offers them. Tom is asking the community for help footing the bill for a new motor and he also wants to put a cover on the pontoon. From there, anything else that we raise, I'm hoping we can just hand them a check. And what a cool opportunity to be able to just hand them some cash when this is all said and done to cover some of the costs for this year and maybe more. And since that story aired, Tom and Corey Sullivan did reach their fundraising goal. We were invited out to the Grand River when Tom turned the keys over to Ed. And later that week, the Croton Sportsman took the veterans out on that new fishing boat for the first time. You're never too old to chase your dreams, and two Kent County women hit the big stage to prove that to the entire state of Michigan. That's next.
Welcome back. Two Kent County women want you to know that senior citizens have a lot to offer their communities and they hit the stage to prove it to the entire state. You, 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 you are the wind beneath my wings. Mary Miller is letting her singing voice be heard for the first time in quite a while. I hadn't done anything in the industry and I hadn't sung in years. Can't help. Loving that man of mine. Kathy Agee is doing the same. What I'm going to be doing is singing on stage, which I have not done since high school musicals. Kathy just turned 60 and Mary just turned 72. Both are looking to make life's next chapter one for the ages. How do I make this fun? What is something I can look forward to rather than going like, oh, I'm old. Can hardly wait to do this pageant. <laughs> Kathy and Mary are each hoping to be crowned the next Ms. Senior Michigan. I think it's a way to acknowledge that senior women truly are treasures and resources, that, that we are experts in many fields. Tony Sanchez Murphy won the competition back in 2012. She loved it so much that now she's the president of the pageant. It gives us purpose, meaningfulness, a reason to not just retire from life. Contestants are judged on their performance in four categories, talent, poise, an interview, and a philosophy of life that cannot be any longer than 35 seconds. The winner will represent all Michigan senior women, but for Kathy and Mary, getting back out there and hitting the big stage again is a win in itself. Whatever age you are, you can do anything you want to do. The sky is the limit. Eyes up, engage, enjoy life. Let's be an inspiration. Let's see what we, you know, we can show other people like there's stuff to do and it's a really vital time of life and don't cross us off as old ladies. Wouldn't dream of it, Kathy. Now, since that story aired, Anna Flynn Owens Wolf ended up being crowned Ms. Senior Michigan this year. She's a 71 year old school teacher and a Vietnam veteran from Flint. Congratulations, Anna. Well, a man owes his life to the quick thinking of a small lakeshore town. Up next, how Pentwater beat the buzzer. Welcome back. The heroes of basketball games are usually the players who make the last second shots. But in a lakeshore town, a team of community members who were the ones who beat the buzzer at a game. Excitement was in the air as fans filed into the Pentwater gym for a homecoming game against Baldwin. But by far the biggest story of the night did not happen on the basketball court. It happened right inside the entrance to the school. I was selling raffle tickets and out of the corner I heard, help me, help me. So I ran over there and there was a gentleman. I, he grabbed my arm and locked and he said, I'm dizzy. Lucy Major and another person lowered the man to the ground. Our superintendent was in the lobby with a group of people and I yelled, Dr. K, man down. Seconds later, we had a, a EMT, Mr. Hader came to the site and took control of the situation. Another parent had called 911. Pet water rescue, pet water fire. Have a priority one CPR in progress call 600 East Park Street at the school inside the lobby. The patient didn't have a pulse and they were retrieving the AED and a shock was administered and um, and then um, he received a, his pulse was back. That's when officer Amanda Snigowski arrived to help with post shock patient care. You just want to make sure that they're comfortable. They're um, still breathing. We checked his vitals, so blood pressure, oxygen levels, uh, some of the supplies that we didn't have we needed. So uh, Brad ran to the fire department to grab the oxygen. And then by that time, the ambulance was arriving. At the scene there, like we knew he was coming around a little bit. Um, like he was becoming a little bit of uh, coherent, but um, it was still touch and go. Later on that night, good news was announced at the game. The game announcer came on and said that he, he's recovering, he's in stable condition. So it was uh, the whole gymnasium erupted in emulation and cheer. He thinks he still has a long road ahead, but just the fact that he's here live and breathing, you know, is with his family is, is great. On homecoming night, Pentwater was prepared 
and they hope they can inspire other communities to be ready for anything. Having that CPR AED knowledge is, it's huge. The fire chief tells me ever since that day, the patient has been doing rehab work and the last they heard he was doing well. If you have a story idea for us, you can send it to one good thing at 13 on your side.com. And remember, we are looking for deeply personal stories with a call to action. Until next time, I'm Matt Gard. And I'm Juliet Dragas. Thanks so much for watching this special presentation of 13 on your side news and one good thing.